Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, where today John and I have a very special guest. We do, Art, and uh, she's an old friend, if you will. Um, she's a famous author, but still an old friend. She's great with all her fans, and uh, I think Art and I are definitely fans. We've read Absolutely. almost all her books no, uh, up until all, this new one. All of them. Uh, you have read all of them. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I'm, I've got one that I'm rereading, so I kind of think of that as maybe I'm not finished yet. Okay. <laughs> but this new book is one of her uh, three main characters. It's about Allie Reynolds, who's a great character. We'll talk to uh, her about that. But first, I want everybody to know that she is a member of our tribe. She is a mature individual, as we like to say about ourselves, with those of us with white hair. And she, she didn't even start writing until she was about 40 or so. Great story, personal story. Uh, her name is J.A. Jantz, and she's, uh, she, we're very proud to have her back again to talk about her new book. Let's bring her on, Art. Hi, J.A. Hi, J.A., good to see you again. I'm glad to be here, thank you. <laughs> yes. Now, I have to, if, if you don't mind, I would like to just touch on the fact, for those people that don't know your work, even though you're a New York Times bestseller, You've got 70 books in print or more, if I'm not mistaken. Just give us a quick background of how you didn't get started until you were, I don't know, in your 40s. Well, for one thing, I wasn't allowed in the creative writing program at the University of Arizona in 1964 because I was a girl. I married a man <laughs> who was allowed in the program that was closed to me. He never published anything. He imitated Faulkner and, and Hemingway primarily by drinking too much and writing too little. And he, he actually died of chronic alcoholism at age 42, a year and a half after I divorced him. But in the late 60s, when we first married, he told me there's only going to be one writer in our family and I'm it. Uh. And so other than writing bits of poetry under the dark of night when he was passed out cold in his recliner, I didn't do anything about my writing until I divorced him, moved to Seattle. And I took the Dale Carnegie course thinking it would turn me into a better insurance salesman. And in fact, it didn't it turn me into a writer because I gave a talk in Dale Carnegie, your participants are required to give talks on specified subjects. And one of them was to talk about something that changed the course of your life. And I talked about a time in 1970 when my first husband and I crossed paths with a serial killer. And after the talk, one of my fellow classmates said, somebody should write a book about that. And that thought that went through my head is, I'm divorced. What have I got to lose? She said that on Thursday night at the class, Sunday afternoon after church, I picked up a blue line notebook and a pen, and I started work on my first novel. Uh, and, and God bless you, the rest is history. Right. I, I, I wrote that novel, which was never published, by the way. It was 1,400 pages long. But I wrote that by hand in a writing frenzy because I started in the middle of March and I got to the end of that book on the 22nd of May of, of 1982. Okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you here for a moment because... Uh, there's so, so many wonderful resources about you, your background, jajance.com, and it'll be in the description below. Great place to go. I read your blog all the time, and I'm going to bring it up because it has something about your latest book. But why don't we get right into your, your new book, uh, Ali Reynolds, Collateral Damage. And how did that come about? And I, I know that you have some interesting stories about how you did, because you've been publishing about two books a year, and I think this one was a slightly different process for you. So could you tell us about collateral damage? Well, collateral damage took me a full year to write. Really? 
I had never taken a full year to write a book in my whole life. And so I started it and I wrote, I had written what was probably about a third of the book and I gave it to my husband, Bill, to read. Now, Bill is a retired electronics engineer and what engineers do is they fix things. And so I gave him nine chapters to read and he struggled with it for a while. And, and then he gave me back and he's, he's either a very, he's a very wise man and also a very brave one because he handed it back to me and he said, and this is a direct quote, this is a mess, I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, nobody needs that kind of honesty, do they? Actually, it's, it's really important because what I did is I tried to read it and he was right, it was a mess. Now, I don't know if you guys ever went to Sunday school, but I grew up with that song, the foolish man built his house upon the sand and the wise man built his house upon the rock. And in trying to read those nine chapters, I realized the book had no foundation. I was a third of the way in and the killer was in the background, but he hadn't come into focus. So then I had to put him in at the beginning and that that called for a complete rewrite. So I wrote a little at a time, a little at a time, a little at a time. And at this point in my husband's and my lives, not only is the pandemic going on, but his health has necessitated my being doing a lot of caregiving. And so writing that book seemed like a, this absolutely glacial process. And I thought, I finally finished it. I turned it in the end of April. I had started it the previous March, March a year before. So I turned it in the week before my new editor was getting married. So she got married, she went on her honeymoon. So the book sat there. I'm used to writing two books a year. So I write the book, I send it in and I get the editorial letter back within a week to two weeks. Well, in this case, it was a month and a half before the editorial letter came back. And when I read it then, I had been away from it long enough that surprisingly enough, some book moved right along. Sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> but Mark, I can attest that this is as, I've read uh, all, well now 71 of your books because some of the books are crossover between characters and including your uh, poetry which uh, maybe we'll speak about a little bit later, but people should go take a look at that book as well for very special reasons. But this book was as good as, if not, I, I hate to say the best because there have been so many really great ones, but I would like to um, uh, uh, maybe have you uh, address one thing that struck me. Uh, I particularly enjoyed this because we hear, hear so many bad things about police, you know, and, and killing uh, drivers and things like that in the news, but the vast majority of police are really hardworking, dedicated people, particularly detectives on homicides, because they want to give some closure to um, uh, the, the victim's families. And mm -hmm. this has so many hardworking, dedicated police detectives that it, it, it's, it's almost like a, an homage to great police work. Well, as one of the fictional detectives says to his wife, his wife is sort of, well, his wife is wonderful, but he, she keeps telling him that it takes a village to raise a child. And he gives that back to her and said, in this case, it takes a village of cops to bring down this killer. Because what we have is a revenge fueled killer who has murdered people and is attempting to murder someone else all over the western half of the United States. So there are a lot of jurisdictions involved. Yeah. And and you meet one one 
character after another. And, uh, and before a book comes out, I have my daughter read the book. My husband reads the book to fix it. My daughter reads the book just before I start doing interviews to remind me what's in it because I've written another book since I finished writing this one. And uh, by the way, the next book was written in two months flat. But <laughs> she said, Mom, all the characters in this book feel like real people. Yes, and yes, they do. And that's, that's what the headlines don't tell us about the people who are police officers. We don't know their background. In many cases, they joined the police force because of being motivated by some part of their own family history. So we meet the various officers, but we also discover their, their history on, along the way. One of them who is tasked with telling two separate families that their loved one is gone, lived through being told that her mother had been killed as a child. And so they're little vignettes of their history. It's not a whole book about each character, but you do connect with them. Yes. Now, I think I think it's time for us to um, kind of take a step take a step backwards and talk about Allie Reynolds a little bit, because mm -hmm. for those people who are not uh, regular readers of the Allie Reynolds series, the mystery series, um, they need to know that Allie in this book, uh, besides being the titular main character, is at least she and her family are the collateral damage right. from this, what turns into a massive multi-state investigation and what I love about this book, J.A., is you tie together. Not only do you, not only do you present all these, all these locations where murders have taken place, where this revenge killer has hired somebody to kill another person, but you bring together the cops of that jurisdiction, who are kind of flying, flying blind. They're they're all working on a piece of the puzzle. And they don't see the whole puzzle, but Allie Reynolds is in and the, the high noon team. Things. Right. They see the they see they've got the whole puzzle. And what's fascinating, again, I won't I don't want to give the story away, but for those who have not read the Allie Reynolds series yet, you really have to. It's a great series. Allie Reynolds and High Noon and her husband B run High Noon Cybersecurity. And they have a computer, an artificial intelligence computer named Frig. Which... And Frig is a is a really a character in itself. Frigg has a penchant for doing um, hacking and online research, which is illegal. <laughs> so all the information that Hallie Reynolds and High Noon come up with, they can't quite tell people where they got it from, and it's it's it can't be used as evidence. So it's a wonderful, a wonderful combination of putting these pieces together. And having Allie and her team kind of guide these cops. Oh, by the way, did you look over there? Did you? Yeah. Allie came into being because I was tired of all of my other characters and my editor suggested I write someone new. And I had no idea how to, who was going to be in the book. Had a terrible case of writer's block. The deadline was actively ticking like on one of the shows with the bomb timer. County, <laughs> and my the local Tucson uh, NBC station removed my favorite newscaster Patty Weiss because she was fifty three, and they just yanked her off the air unceremoniously, very much like what they just did to that lady newscaster in Canada, and it's a bad idea to make mystery writers mad, so within minutes of being mad as hell that Patty Weiss was gone, all of a sudden I was writing about Allie Reynolds being yanked off her anchor desk in LA and coming home to Sedona to sort of start over. And she does. And then along the way, I'm writing along, I'm writing along. 
I write in the family room with my chair on one side and Bill's chair on the other side. I'm writing, he's reading stuff. And he said to me one day, you know, AI is pretty mi interesting. You should, you should write something about AI. And I looked at him and I said, are you nuts? I'm a liberal arts major. <laughs> <laughs> but he started giving me material about AI. And he maintains that there's a wearing blender in my head and information <laughs> comes into it through however it comes and it goes through the blending process. And then when it leaks out through my fingertips where I have no workable fingerprints anymore because I have typed so many years, um, it's different. So he handed me all those articles. I read them and what came out was Frigg. She was created by a guy who wanted her to help her help him become a serial killer. So she was trained to do coloring outside the lines from the very beginning. And now that High Noon has her, they need to keep her reined in, but she's too valuable to just ignore. So yeah. what I like about Frigg is in one of the books, her, the guy who runs her, Stu, Stu Ramey, said, well, what does that have to do with the price of peanuts? And she immediately started giving him information on current peanut futures. Because <laughs> she is totally, she's literal. Yes. So she doesn't get these little funny asides. And it, and that's that's where little pieces of humor come into the book, when when she's trying to sort out what somebody has said and what it really means. And yes. I'd like to also uh, also indicate that um, not only have uh, you had AI uh, around for a couple of books now, I think Ali Reynolds is in the, maybe this is the 16th book, it's some, somewhere in that, that range, 15th or 16th uh, volume. This is 17, but who's Seven, counting? Yeah, who's <laughs> counting? Uh, I was, and but you, you count better than I can. Um, but uh, Scattered throughout all of your books is a attention to detail. Uh, when I was uh, uh, getting out of college, I had thought about joining the police force to pay for law school and uh, things like that. So I, so I've always sort of followed this stuff. I've always had an interest in in, in law enforcement, and we always hear things like, and I'm going to give one giveaway: pit maneuvers. You see them all the time with the chases. I never knew what it stood for. Okay, but you do. Because you really research this stuff, it's uh, I'm going to actually read it because I don't want to make it say it's pursuit intervention technique. Who knew? Yeah, yeah. J. H. Ants knew, and then she shared it with all of us and let us know about it. So there's there's so many details of of police work and things that are be uh, of uh, identification systems, which you talked about early on in some of your books, where uh, it, uh, uh, fingerprints could be. Uh, easily uh, found or matched. And so you've gone through all of that technology. So if you want to know anything about police work and about investigative techniques, you're going to find them in the 70s. So J.A. Jantz novels. In, when I started writing J.P. Beaumont, literally 40 years ago, I, I started working on the first Beau book in the, the, late summer, early fall of 1982. So he and I have been together for more than 40 years now. Uh, police technology was blood evidence analysis. They could tell which blood type and they could tell which was human blood and which was what was animal blood. But what knowing a blood type would do, it would eliminate people who didn't have that blood type, but it did nothing about pointing out, pointing in the direction of the actual killer. A fingerprints were the fingerprints on file in that particular jurisdiction. There was no national database. DNA was, it was a word, but it, it didn't have any it didn't have any applications in in crime solving 
And of course, now it's the bottom line in crime solving. So I'm, I've started work on the next Bo book now. He has retired. He's my age. I, I'm 78. I, that was a big surprise to me because during the pandemic, I marched happily in place at 74. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big shock to me when I found out I was turning 78. But he's my age. I gave him my birthday so we both remember as long as I didn't forget. But in this new book, he is venturing in, he works for a volunteer cold case squad, and he is venturing into the world of forensic genealogy, because you can teach an old dog new tricks. J.A., I love uh, talking about your novel. I want to get back to it, but first, I love the fact that you are willing to share your process as a writer. You're willing to share your your um, your background with us, and I, your your act two, your second act of your life, is truly inspiring. So I love to hear about that as well. Well, if you go to a play, you don't get to act two without living through act one. So true. And act one for me was in Bis started in Bisbee, Arizona, a small mining town almost on the border with Mexico. And initially, my father was a miner. And then in the mid-50s, he went from being a brown-collar worker and working in the mines to being a white-collar worker and selling life insurance. When I came dragging home with the guy I eventually married, I can, I can tell you that my parents were not happy about it. and <laughs> They were absolutely right. But when I went ahead and married the guy, uh, my father took me to the woodshed, figuratively speaking, and pretty much insisted that I buy a life insurance policy on my, on my groom, a $50,000 policy of which I was both the owner and beneficiary. When he died in New Year's Eve of 1982-83, that policy was still in effect. And I had held on to it through thick and thin. And believe me, there was a lot of thin. In the spring of 1983, the life insurance poli premiums policy proceeds, not policy, I got my P's all confused. The life insurance proceeds came to me and I took 10% of that, $5,000. And I had written a book that hadn't been published. I had written poetry that hadn't been published. But in 1983, I took that $5,000, invested it in my future as a writer and bought myself a computer. It was an Eagle PC, desktop, 128K of memory, floppy disks, the floppy floppy disks, not the harder version. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't steam driven, but very close. <laughs> and a daisy wheel printer, which created the world's greatest paper jams whenever you tried to print a 400 page document. But that was what I used for years to write books. I, pro I probably wrote the first eight or nine Beaumont books on that Eagle computer. And so my dad in that first act gave me the tool I needed to start down the road of my second act. And that was, that was what my blog was about this morning. My blog, when I was in college, my mother, there, there were seven kids in our family and I was the third one of the first batch. Uh, the second batch, my three younger brothers and my sister were still at home when I went off to college. 
But every week, my mother, who only had a seventh grade education, used perfect grammar and had wonderful handwriting. Every week, she would sit down at the kitchen table and write me a letter letting me know what was going home on back home in Bisbee. And I regard my blog as sort of a doing homage to my mother. And instead of writing to, I, I write a letter to my fans to let them know where books come from, where characters come from, where stories come from, and just a way to stay in touch with them. And that, that's really meaningful for me. Someone, someone today replied to the blog talking about my book, After the Fire, saying that, that she, like me, had been spent 22 years in a marriage with an abusive alcoholic. And she said, After the Fire spoke about that situation with such total clarity and honesty. Well, it was, I was honest because I didn't know I was writing for anybody but me. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, after I read After the Fire, you wrote to me about that book. And she said, I so appreciated your response. So I don't know how many years ago that happened but I have always made it a policy. When someone sends me an email, I reply to them directly. Uh, last week's blog, I, I even, even bad people, uh, last week's blog was really hilarious because when I was writing the first Allie Reynolds book, Edge of Evil, I had this sort of glamour shot photo of me up on the, uh, up on my website at that point, because Bill was my web manager and he liked that that photo better. That was his favorite photo. But a woman wrote to me and said, Dear Ms. Jantz, I have just visited your website and seen your photo. Jesus, you're an ugly broad. I do hope when you go out in public, you wear a bag over your head so you don't frighten people. And I trust before your next tour, you will be <laughs> cosmetic surgeon and have some very necessary work done. <laughs> Sincerely, Melissa G. <laughs> well, it says on the website, I reply to all me, all emails. So I did. While my fingers were still trembling with outrage, I wrote, dear Melissa G, your input is appreciated. Regards, J.A. Jan. <laughs> but, I, I, I want to say at this point, uh, again, John and I are definitely fanboys. You know that. We've spoken enough <laughs> privately through emails and, and interviews. But I will say that, again, if you go to jajans.com, I was wondering the blog. It's almost every Friday, and it's a well-developed short story. I don't know where you get the time to do it. Yeah. And then I realized that most athletes, when they're not on the field, let's say playing football on Sundays or or basketball in their games, or working out at the gym. And I, I imagine in my mind that every Friday, no matter what you're doing, you're exercising storytelling. You may not even realize it, but every Friday, you're keeping in shape. You're at your, your writer's yeah. gym, if you will. Yeah. I wrote a blog every week all through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, and it was like finding a little piece of light well, they're wonderful. Every, but people have suggested that I monetize it. it. It really annoys the hell out of me when I'm trying to read something that I have found on the internet and suddenly there's an yeah. advertisement for tooth implants in the middle of what I'm trying to read. <laughs> I have resisted all suggestions that I monetize my website. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put in a not so shameless plug because I, uh, this is a book I've read uh, at least three or four times, and now that I have to wait three or four months till the next book comes out, uh, uh, Collateral Damage is just wonderful. I'm going to read it again. Go to go to jajance.com, and you can actually purchase it through there, or she has Amazon and tons of other places. This yeah. is the 
This is Act One. This is a lot of what was written in Act One, yeah. and and her amazing story yeah. that she wrote for herself. Because I know I've read biographical. Yep. Right, you wrote for yourself, and then uh, you turned it into uh, uh, a book that is absolutely should be inspiring for anybody who thinks that life is over and they're downtrodden. Uh, I love that cover. I love that cover. Hold it up again. Yeah. Would you? Or, absolutely. Because what's on that cover? That's fireweed at the bottom, mm -hmm. and weed only blooms after a forest fire oh, yeah. title poem in after the fire which i wrote not only after my divorce but after my first husband died the poem goes like this i have touched the fire it burned me but i knew i lived it seared me but it made me whole he called me I went gladly, though I saw the rocks fell laughing through the singeing air. I have known the fire. I'll live with nothing rather than with less. The flame is out. There's nothing left but ash. And that was my first act. And that act had to end before I could move to Seattle, pull myself together, and launch myself off on my 40 years long act two. <laughs> well, we're, we're delighted that you have. Uh, and there's so much on, on wikis and everything to read about uh, J.A. Chance. And uh, I encourage you to do so. And there are tons of listings of all her books in order. So that after, right. after you read uh, 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 Collateral Damage, okay, uh, what you can do is now go back and start reading the first 15, 16, Ali Reynolds. That's actually where I started. Then I, then I went over to Beaumont, which is about, I don't know, uh, 40 or 50 of them. And then there are two other uh, chapters. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I spent five years as a K through 12 librarian on the Tohono O'odham Reservation. And so I learned the stories and legends of the of the desert people and one of their the hallmarks of their storytelling is that a story must end where it begins and you'll find that is true in collateral damage because it begins in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and it ends in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, you know, you bring us back to to the novel, and I wanted to just compliment you on this particular book. It's I found it different than all the other Ali Reynolds novels because it is it takes us now. Of course, Ali Reynolds in her various uh, novels travels all over and, and has adventures and solves mysteries. But this one, she kind of uh, manipulated the police in different districts and everybody from Oregon to Pasadena to Blythe, Color uh, Blythe uh, California to Las Vegas. And she's manipulating, or I, that's probably not the right word, she's helping the police put, pull the puzzle together. And and what I loved about this is it was, as I said to Art earlier, it's very cinematic. It's it's the scenes. We, we jump from this police officer in this location to that one. And and the the whole narrative continues in a very fast paced way. Uh, it just it's it's a a fast ride. It's like being on the back of a galloping horse. Right. It's like five or six days. The the main action is like January 1st with lots of holidays and how to even reach these police officers. And Ali finds a way uh, yeah. uh, uh, to uh, about uh, the uh, eighth or ninth of the month. And what? it just, it, you can't put it down. It's a yeah. typical J.A. Jans book. You can't put it down. <laughs> 
she's she's really steering the ship. Yes. And the other people are on the ship and they don't even know it. <laughs> yes. And it's it's quite a ride. It's quite a ride. The other thing I wanted to compliment you uh, on is, and one of the things I love about your books, it, you know, all of them, the J.P. Beaumont series, the uh, Joanna Brady series, and the Allie Reynolds series, they all have regular characters uh, that we know and love and that we learn uh, about. And when you introduce a new book, you do a wonderful thing for those people that haven't read the previous book. You tell us who these characters are. You give us just enough of a background to appreciate them so that the world of Allie Reynolds uh, comes alive and it's familiar, even if I've never read another Allie Reynolds book before. And I think that's a wonderful trait and a difficult thing to do, I think, for a writer. It, it's something I've learned to do because I've written series all along. And it is starting a book is literally walking a tightrope because you're going to get new readers, hopefully. And so they have to pick up the book and read it and feel like they had a whole book. But you don't want to put in so much of the backstory that your usual readers are going to be bored to tears. So it's important to give enough information, but I don't want to give new readers so much information that they don't have to go back and read the back list. Yeah. yeah, very true. Someone told me once, and this is, was a remark I've, I've quoted often, and I really like it. He said that reading, reading one of your books is like eating Fritos because you, you can't read just one. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to give you the last word, but my favorite, and there are so many really great passages in this book, but you were referring to the nemesis cop. He was really only trying to do his job. I won't name him. Yes. Okay, you said to him, uh, when uh, he was uh, starting to interview uh, uh, your husband, her husband B, uh, and she never changed her name, she says, and, uh, and she, without being asked, because he was looking at why do you have different names, I didn't change my name, and he didn't change his. And I thought that was when she replied to the cop yes. that was going to interrogate them. And it's just another way that I see that you are uplifting strong women and letting them speak for themselves and saying who they are. So we want to give you the last word. Well, but that's a piece of my life walking around in my book because <clears throat> my first husband's name was Jerry Jens, but it was spelled J-A-N-C. So it was mostly mispronounced Jank. So after he died, I went to court and I paid 400 bucks to add that E to the end of my name so people would say it Jans like dance instead of jank like tank. Well then, when my second husband came along and asked me to marry him, I said, sure, but I just paid $400 for this name and I'm not changing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, piece of dialogue in the book is straight out of my own history. Yeah, I, I saw that. Anybody who's read any, any of your history or um, uh, uh, your uh, poetry will get that. So I, I think the last thing yeah. we want to do here is, we, besides thanking you, is, John, let's do another shameless plug. Okay. Oh. Go out and get collateral damage. You will absolutely thank J.A. Jance, and she'll answer your emails. And look at her uh, a, a weekly blog, okay? And you're going to thank us if you haven't yeah. previously been introduced to J.A. Jazz. So thank you again. Yeah, and, and Life J.A., J.A., <laughs> JA don't take another year to write a book, okay? Okay. Well, the next one is due out in September. It's called Blessing of the Lost Girls. It's the next Walker family book. And I really did write that book in two months. Wow. Well, thank you, because that means that we don't have to wait a year in between interviews. No. Yes, let's do this again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I know everybody who uh, is a reader of yours appreciates these interviews. And I'll bet there's some new readers out there because they've been inspired by this interview. So thank you. Thank you so much.
For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.